Oh, so, lots going on up here. I actually bought a couple Van Gogh paintings, um, like a shirt, had a whole bunch of Van Gogh paintings on it, and it didn't get here in time, so I was like, all right, I guess I'll become my own Van Gogh painting. All right. A, a self-portrait of the master, a uh, painting made in the image. Ah, uh, okay, we got a lot of connections there, because we're made in his image, so I thought it was a really nice little connection. Speaking of paintings, these are actually, uh, this is uh, some of Van Gogh's most famous works. There's a whole bunch of them. I've been on this painting kick, ask my wife. I've been buying a whole bunch of these pots and painting them uh, replicas or versions of Van Gogh paintings. It's just been something, I guess, since I had my son, I just got so soft and just so right, emotional that I just had to take out some of my emotions and love on these pots and diapers. So, that's a little bit of how this is going on. What's interesting, and we're going to touch on this now, we're going to come back to it. Van Gogh's early works, a lot of his works, there's actually a bunch of his works that don't look like this. If we all think about Van Gogh's works, I guarantee you, unless you are an insane art enthusiast, you probably think about this style. Yes. Because this style is what made him... Uh, really stand out and what really made his works last well beyond his lifetime. Amen. They're considered Impressionism, but he has a specific version that he does um, that he painted, and it's really beautiful. And sometimes, the reason why I like paintings as well, uh, you know, the difference between a photograph and a painting, sometimes the painting can present emotions and moods and movements and different attributes that maybe a photo won't. And so it's, it's really beautiful to look at this. And, and also to remember that all these paintings, all these photos, all this you know, self-portraits, whatever it is, drawings, singing, all that is just, uh, it's, it, it's really just us working off the overflow from the Creator because God is the Creator. He created everything. He made this beautiful landscape outside that we're looking at. And it changes literally every second. As I'm looking now, I see branches moving. There's a beautiful masterpiece out there that God is creating and constantly changing from every single angle. So I could spend hours and hours on this to try and capture one starry night when he's creating billions and billions and unimaginable numbers of these beautiful starry nights from every angle to everyone to look at. And every one of you are his masterpiece. In the same way, you're not going to look at Van Gogh and say, oh, that's trash. Don't look at yourself and say you're trash, because he created you his masterpiece. Yes. We're going to come back to that. <laughs> um, so, this, a lot of these things were just to uh, exemplify creativity. And when I talk about creativity, I'm talking about it on a very simple, broad definition. Seeing something as it could be. Seeing the potential or the what if. Um, some sort of filter to see through. So you could see out there, a painter might see um, colors and blues and the paint that he's going to use to paint it. Someone who's into music might hear the rustling and the, wheat, the leaves and they might think of a song. There's, the, there's a whole bunch of different ways we can look at that. Imagination is essentially just creating a... a can, can you all read this? Is that, some people might not be able to read it totally. Um, but... Essentially, when we look at something, we'll take raw elements and we'll create something with it. Something that wasn't there or add something to it. Um, and really, it, it's like, and it's never going to be totally from scratch. Because recognize that we don't create the atoms that create things. Ultimately, yeah. God is giving us yes. the resources, the tools, the materials, everything to create everything. So we are simply arranging. One of the first things we see, God created. He's introduced as creative. Right? And as he, he creates, and then the first thing he commands man to do is what? Be creative and create names. And then till and garden, the, take care of the garden. And if anyone has ever gardened, gardening is an art. The same way cooking is an art, there's a lot of things they are arts. You have to be creative. You have to be able to see, as, as Carmela can look at some dough and some uh, pesto and some tomatoes, she sees a pasta. Yes. You know, uh, the same way I can see, uh, right, so we can go on with a lot of different examples, but you are using a filter of some sort of creativity to see a potential in something, a what if in something. So, as we keep 
going, I'm going to add a couple of these up here. The what if. So we see the what if through the filters and frameworks. And it's important what filters and frameworks we're looking through. So we're going to kind of talk about that. We're going to mention a couple different ways that creativity is existing. And the first one will be God. God is creative. And he has uh, created us some framework so we can also be creative with him. Now before we jump on that... We're going to talk about what the framework should be when we talk about creativity. Because there are things that are, you could argue, are creative, but that's not how we're supposed to do things. So, uh, a simple one would be Philippians 4.8 is one of the, a great way to frame what we're doing. It's finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. In order to create works like this, this probably took at least three or four hours before I ever even touched it with a brush. You can actually see, I don't know if you can tell, I still have a little mark. I had a whole bunch of little lines and diagrams and I would try, I would spend time thinking and, and meditating on, on a, a, a pattern and how to put it on there so it, it matched as, as well as possible the thoughts in my head, the painting I was doing. There's a, you have to meditate to create art. You have to be thinking in a direction for that to come out and manifest in something creative. And so, this is something we think noble, right, pure, right? And then another one could be true. These are just examples, but I believe these will be good ones to work with. The true. So, whatever it is has to be true. It can't contradict... God doesn't lie, so it can't contradict God. You understand Scripture, so you understand that whatever is happening needs to line up with the Bible, needs to line up with Scripture. All of His words are truth. You know, and every one of his righteous ordinance are, are everlasting. So it's true and it will last forever. Another one is under God. This is a big one. It kind of gets lost a little bit. Th these are all simply to point to the creator. We're not worshiping the creation. And never once are we saying this or never once are we trying to um, exalt ourselves. This is not about us. It's about us trying to tell a story, point to Jesus. We use our pain, turn, turn it with paint to make an arrow to point to Jesus. And that's the only reason why we would do any of these things. And in, in that same idea, we point to Jesus because it is ultimately to please and glorify God. That is the point. Whatever we do, we do it with excellence as unto... Right, so whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as if working for the Lord, not for humans. Right, unto the Lord. It's got to be part of what, what pleases God. What pleases God is part of the, re, the ministry of reconciliation. So often you will see these point in ways that you could argue are evangelistic. I was brought closer to the Lord because of this. I saw some break dancers, and um, there's a couple ministries with Evoke and Soul Movement, Soul Culture, and these guys were b-boys, break dancers, who were worshiping the Lord and having Bible studies in between dancing sets. And that is what really drew me in and drew closer. And if you want to learn more about that, Nations Church has Nations Creatives now, and they've taken over some of that. Yeah, but through all this, also remember what pleases God... Give yourself some grace, because ultimately what pleases God is faith, because we don't always get it right. We do our best to stay within the framework, and we move within that framework, but sometimes we aren't going to get it right. So also, don't kick yourself, because we need to see through that lens of faith, okay? First you don't succeed, keep going. Use the Spirit's strength to keep going. So back to God, right? We've kind of laid the groundwork for creative, okay? No one's going to get crazy and start sprinkling blood on some couch and say, oh, I'm being creative, okay? Like, we got to follow some guidelines, okay? We're not going to point to us and say how great we are. We're going to keep the guidelines of creativity. You good? I'm talking kind of fast. i got a lot to go over. So, he is, well, initially, his first thing is the creator. It was through him that um, everything was made, John 1, 3, everything. I can't even fathom how creative. And the fact is, it's interesting because he talked about let light be. So did light cr exist before or after? It doesn't matter. He still created it. He created all the animals. He had either a thought in his mind and he created them, or he created them before. Who knows? 
the fact is God created everything. He starts off as a creator. One of the things that he's described as is a creator. You go through scripture, you find him as a vine dresser that's gardening again. A father. Parenting is creative. If you have kids, you will recognize that. He's a potter. That's a little more literal. That is extremely creative. A singer. We see in Zephaniah, he sings over us. An architect. He gave blueprints for a boat, for a tabernacle, for a, a, a house of worship in Solomon's time. And, and we see that Jesus was a tecton, which is often referred to as a carpenter who was creative. And they also worked with stonework, so he was kind of like a stonemason. He was a storyteller. He was an ex expert. It's so many different things, so many different what we would consider creative, um, but also author, right? That's probably one of the things God is most known for because he wrote this book <laughs> through human hands and creativity, the Bible. Now, there are things in the Bible that are very literal and we aren't really supposed to take much wiggle room with, right? So something like Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he raised from the dead, you will be saved. That is literal. We do not take creative license with that. We recognize that that is literal. But something like Psalm 6, 6, where David says, I am weary with groaning. All night I cried to make my bed swim. I drenched my couch with tears. Well, we clearly know he didn't cry so much that he flooded his room and now his bed's floating and he's on it like, you know, <laughs> playing like a kid, at, at, you know, would in a pool. No, that's literal. You know what's crazy? Um, I was listening to the Bible Project, and they mentioned they believe 30% of the Bible is some form of uh, what they would call ancient poetry, so some form of figurative language. Um, parables, psalms, songs, wordplay, God often says uh, through his people, this was like this. He gives analogies, examples, all that. So, And sometimes it's both literal and figurative. Uh, so a literal would be like Exodus 14, when he says something specific. Hey, the waters were divided, and the Israelites went through on the sea is dry ground, with, uh, with water on the right and left. Literal. And then you see it again in Exodus 15, in a song that Moses sings, and the people sing, By the breath of your nostrils, the water stood firm like a dam, and they stood as if they were flowing in water skins. The depths assembled in the heart of the sea. So that's just one example. You've got plenty more of those. So we do see this creativity within what is written. And puns. So... <laughs> Puns are in the Bible. The, the Hebrew word, this is in Jeremiah 1, 11. And Jeremiah 1, 11, the, let me just preface this. The word for almond and the word for watch are the same word. It's saket. It sounds like the same word, saket. It's a word play, saket. So to, to eat an almond is to eat a saket. To watch something is to saket something. And what happens is, since they sound the same, God showed Jeremiah an almond, asked Jeremiah, hey, what do you see? Jeremiah says, oh, I see an almond, a saked. He's like, good, because I'm going to saked over my word. I'm going to watch over my word. Let me try and explain it this way. It'd be as if God said, hey, what do you see? And you see a watch. watch. And God says, yeah, because I'm going to watch over my promises and fulfill them. Okay? Yeah. Woo. So, <laughs> the... It's, he talks in ways to make his points. I believe he talks in puns to me a lot. Uh, but he may talk to you in different ways depending on how you receive it. Maybe he speaks more literally to you. It's also good to seek him because you may see a hammer. It might mean to nail. It might mean to um, uh, build a church. It might mean a lot of different things. For example, rock. Somebody says, I'm going to rock Chicago. I heard that and I was like, yeah, we're going to rock Chicago for God. And they're like, no, 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 no. Rock, like a baby. So, always seek him on the interpretation with that, because he does speak that way. One of the best examples of creativity through scripture isn't necessarily just what's words, what's spoken, what's said. It's what's done and how it's done. Uh, God could simply speak directly, and he does sometimes, or he could decide to use some creativity, or let us use creativity. Ezekiel is a great example of that. Uh, for example... Ezekiel, Ezekiel, example, I'm sure there's something there. Eze the example in Ezekiel, he actually built a model of Jerusalem and used it as sort of a performance art to make certain points of God. He also cut off some of his hair. Yes, this is a man bun. No, it, it actually is like an antenna. I can hear God better. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, he cut off some of his hair. He cut off some of his hair and he essentially did performance art. He burned some, he threw some in the wind. 
Um, I have a notification, so I don't know what that other was. Oh, he used a sword to cut some. He also cooked his food over his dung, but that's a different conversation. He essentially did performances to get points across that God was speaking to him. Um, man, there are so many examples. Moses wrote songs, sung songs, chiseled rock, authored books, made speeches, sculpted. He actually sculpted the serpent. Um, and then we have people like David, who's a singer, songwriter. He played instruments. He wrote music. He wrote poems, authored books, dance. We get those. Those are pretty simple. Essentially, what I'm seeing is this trend of God allowing people to be creative. God um, actually questioned, some people may know this, who was the first person in all the Bible mentioned to be filled by the Holy Spirit? So, in, and you know how like in different um, circles, like different things are more popular? Like this is a super popular thing within creative people, um, in, in like artistic, creative, traditional ways. It, what, what it is, is there was this, sorry, I'm getting a notification. There was this, Okay, so within scripture, Moses was going to start creating the tabernacle, and the first person in scripture says was filled by the Holy Spirit was somebody to help him, a creative, artistic, do you remember? Uh, Bizzio or something. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. so I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, Bazazel. If I pronounce it wrong, I'm being creative in my pronunciation. So Bazazel was the first person in, in <coughs> Exodus 31 that is mentioned to be filled by the Holy Spirit. And he was a, a craftsman. It says, God called him by name, filled him, I, I filled him with my spirit, and given him essentially the ability to design and craft and build and make creative things that Moses needed to put into the tabernacle. People like Moses needed people like Bazazel to complete the tasks that were in front of him. We have another guy, Oleab, I may be pronouncing that wrong. He's actually pointed out as an engraver, a designer, and an embroiderer. And then it says, every skilled person to whom the Lord has given the ability and who was willing to come and do the work. And then we have tons of examples within that, especially around just those examples of the temple um, and the tabernacle. We've got linens and curtains and leathers and clasps and moldings and tents and clothing and statues of statues of cherubim, bulls, trees, flowers. We, I mean, you can go through all of scripture and find lots of examples of this. Paul was a tent maker. Some people describe that as like blankets and, and prayer shawls. And there's, there's creativity within that of the colors you use and all sorts of things like that. And, but this was more, those examples were most prominent with the building. Speaking of building, Pastor Jim, uh, there's a desire that uh, God has placed in Pastor Jim of creatively redesigning a building that was once something else into a church. And we actually have a building fund over there. Okay. Plug done. Roller rink. A roller rink. Used to be a roller rink. Think of the creativity in that. Yeah. Roller rink. Yeah. Yeah. So, we've gone over a little bit of that, right? Now, let's talk about us. We're going to talk about a couple uh, recent examples. So, God will often give a command, right? Sometimes it's very specific. You do have... Some make mm -hmm. jurors, but a lot of times he'll give us a command and give us the freedom of creativity within the proper framework to see it happen. So, um, for example, God didn't uh, tell David to build a temple. He went to God and said, I wanted to build you a house. Um, God didn't call Isaiah. Isaiah volunteered. He said, who will go? He said, I will. And so he puts desires. And so depending on how we act in them, what's interesting is I think about some of the gaps in scripture. Mm -hmm. And like, um, let's not get crazy, okay? <laughs> I'm not getting crazy. I'm just, some, some little gaps within scripture, like when Noah built the ark, they had to have systems to get rid of waste, and to feed the animals. And, you know, within the bedrooms, were there beds in there? Was there, you, so there's these little things. God will have typically the framework. They'll give you, right? But then within that, you kind of create. It's sort of like, if God were to give us a big puzzle, what you would do is, when you start puzzle, anybody that's a good puzzle puzzle doer, puzzle maker, puzzle putter together, what you typically do, most people, will start from the edges. And you get those right edges, and then he lets you work within. So you have the right edges, and then you can work within. So he creates the art. There's still creativity there. They had to do some of these things. Um, we are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Spirit, and, and because we're inspired by the Holy Spirit, we have the greatest empowerer, the most creative, creative force on the planet, 
to inspire us, often we can be sort of the bar for creativity. So Catherine Kuhlman is an example. Yeah. Uh, Catherine Kuhlman, yeah, people, if people have known her, they, they know she's coming up in this sermon. Uh, she was known for some very interesting sermon illustrations, like uh, driving a motorcycle on stage and just interesting things. So her, her whole thing <laughs> with creativity was um, some of the Hollywood directors and producers and, and people like that would go to her services and learn what she's doing and then try and copy her. So Catherine Kuhlman kind of led the way in creativity in that way. And so in the same way, um, we, we as Christians have the ability, rather than going into Instagram or whatever and trying to rip off somebody or rip off someone else's, we can, through the Spirit, be creative, move on the creativity the uh, Spirit gives us. We're not ripping off them. The world's trying to rip off us. I believe that's the idea. And I think it's interesting because when Jesus says, go into all the world, we need to absolutely see that as literal. We should go physically into all the world but also go into the world of art, go into the world of music, go into the world of fashion, of painting, whatever that sphere of influence that you have, go into that world and preach the gospel. Now let's get back to Van Gogh. Um, a little background about Van Gogh, he, uh, his father was a pastor, and a lot of it, he does have some paintings, and he talks about in his letters about the Bible and different things in churches, and actually, when he was a little bit younger, he was a missionary. He was a missionary to poor miners. And through his organization that sent him, they said, when you're a missionary, you need to be like a, a sort of, I don't want to say like wealthy class, but their idea was you kind of are like on a certain level of uh, fi finances if you are a missionary. That was just how they did it. And he, Van Gogh decided to give away everything he had and live in poverty to preach to them, and they essentially let him go. So he had some issues with the institution of church, and he, he was a troubled man who went through a lot of different things, and he suffered from illnesses and things like that. So we don't know exactly where he fits with everything, but we do know he, there was a, something in him. It actually, it actually says, I was reading this article, it says, young Vincent made a decision if he could not preach to the poor from the pulpit, he would preach them sermons without words through his paintings. Um, and so there's there's different things we can look when he talks about how he sees God through nature and things like that. I mean, all of nature cries out to him. Now, we're not going to get crazy because there's ways to drag that out, right? So we're going to keep it within the framework, right? Um, but in, in the same way, Van Gogh wasn't necessarily... Um, I don't want to say successful, that's not the right word. We say, like, he really found his groove, and he really accomplished what he needed to accomplish, and his works last well beyond his death. When he stopped trying to paint what everyone else was painting and try to paint things exactly as he saw them, or, paint, or, sorry, exactly as they were, he painted them as he saw them. Now, this is kind of a weird concept. I'm going to try and explain. So, there's one thing to paint things as they are. Another thing to paint things and see things as you see them. So, all right. So, these are some examples, and I'll take this down in a minute, are some examples of some stars Van Gogh painted on some of his paintings. You can kind of see them behind me, but I figured it might be a little hard to see. So, I mean, these might be a little hard to see too, so I apologize. So these are some examples of some stars and lights that Van Gogh painted. Van Gogh is very unique in how he did his stars and paint. In fact, a lot of people will get prints just of the, the nights. His starry night is the most popular painting he's ever painted. And part of it is how he painted the sky with the stars. Now, new research has made arguments that he wasn't necessarily painting what was there, but how he saw it. So, for example, someone has an astigmatism. They see things a little differently. They see light specifically a little differently. And when they look at light, I hope everybody can see this, when they look at light, they use a telescope to try and emulate what astigmatism would look like through a telescope, and they saw that stars looked kind of like this. 
So we see some similarities between how Van Gogh was painting, how he may have been seeing through a filter of astigmatism. We also have another example using a telescope of what stars look like. So do we see some similarities? What is believed is Van Gogh was painting what he saw, not necessarily what exactly was there. Does that make sense? He was using the filter and his faith as the stars looked. And that was one of the reasons why we still know about him, you know, many decades <coughs> after. So, we need to look at this. So the whole point is we have these filters, uh, frameworks, that through faith we see what, what if, what could be. We look at something not necessarily as it is physically. We see how God could enter, right? Uh, it could be through, um, we see them all through faith, right? We see miracles and loving each other. We see trusting God. We see um, a lot of his commands through this. Uh, for example, there was a time where I needed to evangelize. I, I, had, I had a platform at work for a speech. And they said, you can't talk about God, you can't talk about Jesus. Like, no, no, no. And I was like, all right. So I could throw it all away and I could just preach straight up gospel. But I, I was able to have a much longer effect because instead of preaching God and uh, Jesus in the Bible, I preached Isaiah's scrolls found in the Dead Sea. So kind of created, I'm like, listen, I'm just talking about a recent discovery of these scrolls in some cave. So sometimes we do things like that. We find uh, creative answers to problems, right? Creative we creatively look at the world, we creatively see the answers to problems, we creatively see people, how God sees them through a filter of love and of truth and all these things as them being masterpieces. We see uh, opportunities through the filter. We see um, scripture and understanding him and the word through scripture. Like we'll see a problem, right? It's, it's that phrase of a kind of reshifting focus. Right? Don't tell your problem. Don't tell God how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big God is. You essentially see it through the filter of what we know through faith. You know, and, and this kind of concept allows creativity in, in so much more than just the fine arts, what people would consider traditional. We see creativity in literally everything. Someone could be creative in how to be hospitable or how to speak to a neighbor, how to love somebody else. We're allowed to do this filter in whatever we look at, just because we're not painting a pot, you know, or whatnot, it doesn't mean we can't be creative, and God is empowering us. It says, it says to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your strength, and all your mind. So what you're meditating on, use your imagination. If your imagination is part of your mind, you should be using it to glorify God in making ideas and choices and seeing things, putting that filter, right? He says, we don't see everything under his feet, but we know that it is under his feet, and we have to see it through that. There's a bunch of different scriptures in that direction. This idea, actually, you, I think it, it creates more dependence on the Spirit than anything else. Because if this happens, we're forced to be creative and to think outside the box. We can't necessarily use formulas every time. We are forced to look at something and say, all right, God, what do you want to do this time? How can we be your vessel in this situation this time, you see a Facebook post, let's say there's a world event going on, or there's problems in the world, right? Rather than just perpetuating and sending some links to one another, what about God download into you, into me, what is something creatively I can speak? Because we'll just talk about some of the current events. I guarantee you, if you send links and things like that about certain current events, they're not going to read it. People have made up their minds. But if the Lord gives you supernatural creativity on how to speak to people, that's a completely different story. And that it increases your dependence on the Holy Spirit and your relationship with God. You see the what if, and you ask God, and you move in faith in that. So creative ministry isn't just for mission trips or for the kids you know, who wear bright tie-dye shirts and dance on stage when they go to another country. right? It's not even necessarily art, as we see traditional art. We're simply seeing through the filter of creativity that God downloads in us with the right framework. God gives us materials, God gives us commands, and, and the, the majority of the time, we're allowed some, some freedom within that to glorify Him, to please Him, to, to search, seek after souls, to uh, love one another, whatever that looks like, to create something beautiful that can point to the King.
We, it's important that we make sure that our passion for the gift or talent does not exceed our passion for Him. And I think this, if done right, will be something used to channel and demonstrate our passion for Him. If not to Him, but to others. Remember, because creativity in its most simple form is just seeing something as it could be. Seeing the potential, seeing the what if, seeing that filter. So let's put that filter on. Van Gogh saw things through a filter of both art and potentially a medical filter. And you can too. The bigger takeaway is God is creative. He created you in his image to be creative. So you are creative too. Naturally, by default. You don't have to worry about putting paint on a, a canvas, but he did create you to be creative, to solve through his strength, through his spirit, to solve whatever issues are in front of you, to create masterpieces in front of you. You are his masterpiece that creates masterpiece and drew, draws the other masterpieces to him. Having this framework, whether it's in astigmatism or artistic or this, that's the point. You can use all those things to be creative for God. And so I commission you to seek God on how you can do something a little different. How can you be creative for God? How can you do something a little different? How can you put a filter over maybe how you've seen the same thing every day, the same potential issue, the same person, loving somebody, whatever that is. I'm commissioning you to seek the Lord and ask how you can be creative and see something different, see the what if through faith and move on it. And it's okay if you get it wrong, okay? Like that's, it's faith. Faith ultimately pleases God, not getting it right. Faith pleases God, and if we move in faith with these parameters, I believe you will actually see things happen.